Welcome back, everybody, to uh, another wonderful episode of Energy Bites. Uh, Rad Dad here, John Calfian. My lovely co-host, Bobby Nealon, is out today. His uh, son woke up with a double ear infection, and as a father of two, I feel his pain on that. So hoping his uh, his son feels better. And uh, But we're here today with Quentin Jones, senior manager at... Uh, Accenture, thanks for joining us, man. I oh, appreciate it. Glad to be here. I'm glad to, uh, you know, we we had a lot of communications and stuff at my, when I was at my last company because it made a lot of sense. And then we both went to new companies and haven't had a a, a lot of excuses to, to hang out as much. So I'm glad you could uh, come on and chat with us. No, for sure. For sure. It's always nice to take a half day Friday. Absolutely, off. man. That's uh yeah that's that's why we re- we record every other Friday because that's when Bobby has his nine eighties off. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of the the perks of the industry, right? Yeah. Let's jump into it. You know, I've known you for a couple of years now, but uh, let's kind of back up. We were just talking about this before we started, but you know, our first question that we normally ask people is kind of, you know, how did you get into energy and or tech? Whether it's you know, like for me, growing up, I was destroying my parents computers and you know (laughs) hacking my way through stuff and and downloading you know key generators and all kinds of dumb shit (laughs) that was breaking my my uh home my gateway 2000 uh to put a (laughs) time frame on that (laughs) but uh you know how did you kind of initially get into because you're super handy and i know you love tinkering and and messing with stuff but how did you kind of get into energy and then and or tech uh so, kind of so we could go probably three hours long form podcast just talking about that. I've had a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs across the years. But um, yeah, I originally had no plans to get into energy. So mm-hmm. I, um, in high school, was part of work release program. So we had like a hospitality program. Yeah. So I went to work at the Sheraton downtown Dallas and um, ended up working in the kitchen and then ended up getting a job like after school working in the kitchen. So I wanted to be a chef. That's yeah. that was my thing. I had no idea. Kitchen. That's awesome. So yeah, I went to work when I was fifteen. Um, worked there after school, but then also worked at a pizza place, and they had a little Italian joint. And so yeah, I did that. Up just kind of grew up through that path. Like I mentioned, you know, graduated high school to no plans to go to college. Bounced around a bunch of different kitchens. Uh, lived in College Station for a while. Went belly up. <laughs> spent all my money. Got kicked out of my apartment because with the restaurant life comes. Yeah. The other side of that life, right? So anyway, worked my way around, that lived prim- in El Paso. For, huh? Primed you for the oil field. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did. Uh, lived in El Paso for a while doing the same stuff. And then in 2000, I moved to Tyler. My dad was living there, so I moved down there uh, with him. You know, stayed with him for a while and then was working in a, a bar, restaurant, kind of doing dual duty. Um, met my now wife. Um, and so her dad actually owned an oil field services company. So I was gonna say, um, when you get to Tyler, it's, yes. it's hard to get away from the oil field. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything's tied in there. Everything. And so anyway, uh, she ended up getting pregnant. And so it was time to get a real job, make some right. real money. Uh, so I went to work for him, started out uh, installing compressors. So like thread and pipe mm-hmm. and digging trenches and back breaking work, yeah. right? And I was like, man, no way. Like he paid good, but <laughs> right. I didn't want to do it. So- That's- that's one of those, it's like, it's good at the time, but when you start doing it, you're like, I can't do this forever. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I mean, I mean, I was in best shape of my life. It was yep. great, you know, but nah, it wasn't for me. And so I saw a guy putting in a uh, flow meter, right? And so this is 2000, but we were still on Barton chart recorders, right? I mean, we weren't even digital yet. Right. So it was all the, you know, bending the tubing and stuff and putting it on and calibrating. So I was like, I want to do that. That that because he sat in the truck until he had to get out and bend some tubing, right? <laughs> That's another fun thing about being in the field is you're always observe. Like if, if you're observant enough, you'll realize who has the really cush jobs that still gets paid either the same or pro- most of the time more for whatever reason. Yeah, you're like hey, how do yeah. I do that? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so I mentioned that I wanted to do that, and that was an area of the oil field services they didn't have was measurement and instrumentation. So we hired a couple of guys that knew what they were doing. I learned from them. Uh, my first outing was actually running tubing for uh, a CO2 plant. And uh, we ran thousands of miles of tubing, wow. right? So did that for a while. And then we ended up getting a piece of work from Devon where we went around replacing the Barton chart recorders with Bristol Bobcocks. 
And that ran on old Emco software, DOS. <laughs> right? So to calibrate it, it was oh like, God. hold down the space button until it got to zero. Like, oh, okay, it's calibrated, right? It's, it's accurate. <laughs> so uh, we, we uh, all across from, you know, Nacogdoches, Lufkin area, all the way, you know, almost to Austin. That's all we did. We would just run around and we had poles and solar panels and put those in. And so I kind of cut my teeth on digital meters that way. Mm -hmm. um, then I got offered a job at another INE firm that was starting up and doing stuff in the field. Um, and again, it's all about the pay, right? $2 more an hour. Hey. Here I go. Yep. Uh, so I went over there and um, we were doing a bunch of work. Um, and these were our entrance into the first wireless instrumentation, right? So we, Saturday and Sunday, we would stay in a warehouse and build these big boxes, right? That had a little radio in there and terminal blocks. And then we had another side. So you go and you dig a hole next to the wellhead and you put your tube and case and meter on and plug it into that. And then you would have another radio across the pad. So we would go around putting those in. Uh, well, those were RF. Yeah. Yeah. They were just <laughs> basic 900 megahertz yeah. point to point right. MDS radios. And then, and then integrated into the flow meter, you know, via Modbus. Right? Yeah. So did that for a while, and then um, I ended up getting a gig with, still same company, but a gig with Encana Oil and & Gas, and um, over in just just a little north of Nacogdoches and Travis Peak, they have a big field right there, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, 150, 200 wells out there, and they were drilling a bunch, and CPFs, and CIPSRO facilities out there, um, and it was great, because you just turn in off the highway, and it was just pig trap roads, right. and, you know four wheeling all day long. Yeah. And so I just was basically the, the fix it man out there. Right. I'd get 10 or 15 work orders, just hop around and then go if they were putting in a new well and meters. And that was my first foray into a true SCADA system. I'm learning about real comms, back all comms, right. the SCADA systems. Um, and that was in 2006, seven. And so at that time, radio comms were, there was a company that launched weather balloons <laughs> and it had a frequency radio on it. And so when that weather balloon would come over the field, it would absorb right. four hours worth of 15 interval information and then post it up. That makes me think of the, uh, there was some, I can't remember Google's like skunk works, uh, division, but there was some, uh, I read some thing, a, a couple of years ago where they were they were looking at like how do we do you know global distributed internet communications whatever and one of the ideas was a weather balloon style thing where you throw it high up in the altitude and then starlink came out and it was just like yeah <laughs> crash that idea. shit all over that right? like, exactly and then um then that company went bankrupt so let's so staying with the the skata stuff so your first entrance into skata so back then how i mean how do you What's what are some of the big like kind of similarities between SCADA from then and now, and what are kind of the main areas of you know innovation or differences that you're kind of seeing? And I know it's a mixed bag because people acquire people, and you know no one wants to pay to upgrade SCADA once they have it because of the cost and all that fun shit. But yeah, so at at that time we had Signet, right? And mm -hmm. so I thought that was the coolest thing ever, right? Because uh, I worked for a gentleman Charles Lame who's been in the business a long time. Uh, he's over at Waterbridge now, but grew up in Pioneer. So he kind of built one of the first early SCADA systems on his own because you talk about in-house. So we had Signet and he had some good people in there that to build the screens, get the data and stuff yeah. like that. And so it, it was cool because that, you know, I hadn't seen anything else. So that was, right. that was kind of the thing. Um, and then over the years, you started seeing, you know, different companies kind of pop up, right? The Rockwells of the mm -hmm. world and stuff like that. And it was still like, man, okay. Um, and then going to, you know, like y'all were talking about the other day, then inductive automation came, yeah. right? I mean, they blew out of the water, the pricing arrangements, right? And right. just there, you know, however, the other side of it was being fully customizable. You have to have a dev team right. on staff, monstrous to support that. Right. And so I think they're, they're, they're coming along, right. There's getting more into the, to the drag and drop, but you know, it definitely has evolved. Right. But Today, you know, and, and, and I can already know people are going to hear this and start freaking out, but 
the SCADA of old is not being utilized as SCADA as today, right? There is no real supervisory control, right? It's just data acquisition. Right. That, that plain yeah. simple data acquisition. Pulling it here, pushing it here, <laughs> sending it there, right? That's it, man. You know, I mean, you know, it, everybody still relies on the old Purdue model in that polling response, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a few out there that are moved to an MQTD broker, but that's not the primary, right? Yeah. And, and it's not... It's not an enterprise grade deployment either, right? It's, right. Uh, so, but yeah, you you see it come along. So I think that you know another five years probably it will just be dashboards, and then some other type of control component, right. you know, localized, right? HMI yeah. side. Yeah, and it'll be drag and drop and customizable without having to have knowledge of coding on yeah. the back end or yeah. of, of, of anything. Where everything's going with the code on or on the coding side, low code, no code stuff is it's interesting for sure. For sure. So so keep going because yeah. I interrupted you. <laughs> so 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 yeah, so so right then we kind of started my intersection of the tech that because I yeah, I was the same way, right? Mm -hmm. Breaking stuff at the house, pulling it back together, you know, sat in front of that first Mac and was like, oh, this is cool, right? <laughs> and so I've always kind of been tech tech adjacent uh, from that. I did do a stint at uh, at uh, CompUSA for a while. And so I, you know, build computers off to the yeah. side, made some money. RIP CompUSA. It, yeah. Exactly, man. Uh, and, and, and yeah, and then it was the best too because at work we had a T1 line. So I was <laughs> Napster all day. No one understands, <laughs> like, just the the shift the jump in difference from going from 56 even to 256 yeah. on dsl i remember how excited i was to get a dsl line oh yeah that was at first and my parents were pissed because of how expensive it was so like but mom it's five times faster <laughs> it's like i can load an image in two minutes instead of <laughs> 10 you know exactly exactly so so anyway so uh yeah so we had that system with the air balloons until they went bankrupt. And so we actually had two weeks to build a new network out there. And so that's when I first learned about microwave, true microwave. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, we put that out there. Um, and then I became kind of the, the guy that would go to the new areas of development and, you know, set up, set up all the infrastructure, infrastructure, find local teams to, you know, I need techs, get people hired to work with at small SIs. So, uh, we still were living in Tyler, but I was going to Haynesville and spending, you know, 10 days at a yeah. time, 14 days at a time, all that stuff, which was a complete shift, right? Because the typical instrumentation that we used on, you know, Travis Peak Wells, when you had, you know, maybe 60 pounds on casing. Right. Right. To, if, you, if you had pressure. Yeah, right? if you had yeah. pressure. Lots of vacuum <laughs> wells up there. To go into, you know, the first Haynesville well that we had 10,000 pounds of pressure. Yeah, people don't uh, appreciate uh, pressure nearly as much as they should. In the no, I, I'm lucky to have my hands and fingers, yeah. right? Because, and I was trying to teach someone how to take a manual gauge out and put in an Oleum Tech wireless. You know, yeah. that was kind of when we moved into real wireless. And I'm, you know, sitting there and I'm like, okay, you know, close this valve, close this valve, and, you know, take this down. And uh, they had just greased it. So the grease was stuck in the autoclave fitting. So it looked like it right. went to zero, was, but it still yeah. had thousand pounds. Per hour. Anyway, oh, so yeah, it shot out. So lucky to have my hand there. Um, so anyways, went to Haynesville, developed the Haynesville, went to Mississippi, did the TMS wells, mm -hmm. went yeah, up to- uh can pressure, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. It, they were nuts. Then went up to uh, Oklahoma and Kansas to do the water oil wells mm -hmm. uh, out there. Uh, spent a lot of time in Pawhuska, Oklahoma. Shout out to, <laughs> Shout out to Pawhuska. Shout man. out to Pawhuska. Yeah. Love the small uh, oil field towns, man. Yeah. Um, and Bad Brad's barbecue out there, man. Kept us in, in good shape. Um, so anyway, did that, bounced around, uh, personal life. We now have two kids. I'd been on the road nonstop. Right. And my second son... So there's five years difference between my older two boys. So I guess my my middle son now, my middle son now, was about five or six, and my wife was like, "Enough, yeah. <laughs> enough. It's 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 time, right? Come off the road." 
you know, because when I would come in, I'd be exhausted, right. tired, or yeah. you know, whatever. And um, you know the life. So, so anyway, um, at that time, um, uh, Jonathan Klein, as part of Summation, was calling on me to actually bring them in to do some work for for me. So we when we were in the Haynesville. We had a joint venture with Shell, right? And Ken and Shell had those mm -hmm. wells. And so they were doing Shell's work. So they were calling on me to get my work. I ended up flipping that into a job interview, came to Houston, interviewed, got hired on. Um, and at that time, we had moved back to Tyler. And it was pretty much just going to be that, right? I was going to be remote. I'd come in if I needed. Um, and then it became, no, you need to leave in Houston. So it was like, okay, we'll do this five years, right? Come to Houston. Right. Five years, we're out. That was 11 years ago <laughs> that we said that. So came into work with Simation. was a coolest company, man. We were doing a lot of innovative at the time stuff um, around upstream and downstream. Um, so I started just as a guy. I knew Fisher Rocks really well, so I kind of started that guy. Then um, we ended up doing a project for another client that wanted to move into, you know, autonomous operations into a CPF, right? So he could take itself down, bring itself back up. And so I designed that with another colleague of mine and, and, you know, we put auto chokes and you know, spent a couple million dollars yeah. getting it done. Um, but w along with that comes, if you don't, if you don't teach your people, right. it does no good. Right. And so it didn't matter that we had all the automation in the world. They were still driving out there every day, walking around, manually looking at everything. Right. To the point where they built a 10 foot fence, you know, around it, <laughs> locked, <laughs> right? To Cameras knowing when who's going out there and mm -hmm. doing what. And uh, yeah, but then when you start talking about scaling that, right, money dries up pretty quick. Mm -hmm. so. so anyway, did that. Um, and then uh, I ran um, what they called their industrial networking components, so which was like the network guys and then cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity kind of came out of that. Um, and, and, and interesting enough, that was part of the reasons Accenture acquired us. Right. So, um, so I guess th that's the next part of the story. So come up through the, the data track from there, right. I've worked all the way from the sensors up to the backhaul networks, the SCADA systems, the historians, the kind of next generation of stuff, uh, then became IOT, right. Industrial IOT. Right. Uh, and that was going to be the next craze. So did that for a while. And then, um, and then, yeah. And then one day, uh, Jonathan uh, called me up and said, hey, you know, come into the office. I got a project for you. So I did. And, and he said, okay, come Monday. because I need you to put some nice clothes on and go to this office over here. And you're going to help this team that's uh, called Accenture that's trying to do some work. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, great, whatever. So I show up there and, and they were trying to basically take over all OTIT operations right from the the back end so basically what they were going to do is company x would just fire all these people accenture would just rebadge them underneath the project and all that well, as part of that they wanted the field component piece the field networks and all that which accenture at the time didn't have anybody right. that, that knew that um they didn't even know you know putting on frs what that meant right so i kind of came in to play that role and about Six weeks into it, I showed up one morning and the little three-man team I was working with was like, hey, man, welcome to Accenture. It's great. Da, da, da. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they showed me. So they had released messaging internally that Accenture had acquired Cymation. But no one else. But but no, but no, yeah, do it nowhere else. So I go outside and I call Jonathan. I'm like, hey, man, what is this? <laughs> oh, it's crazy. And That's he's like, he's like, dude, do literally do not say anything to anybody. Like we're trying, like the, the right. ink isn't even really dry yet, right. but- you can't can't let that out, right? We can't have this mass, you know, yeah. thing happening, right? Like people are gonna lose their shit. So, uh, so yeah. Anyway, I did. I, I kept my mouth shut and just kind of watched as it as it happened. And luckily enough, though, I'd already kind of been embedded into the Accenture world, so I'd made a pretty good, nice network right. and, and and met a bunch of people and kind of had developed myself with street cred. Uh, yeah. You know, kind of know what I'm talking about, know what I'm doing, um, which was great. And so, yeah, so then, then all the real change, at first they said they're not going to do anything to us. We keep all our office, all this stuff. Yeah. About two months into it, they were like, no, you yeah. know, integrating and how the, how the world just changes. Right. Cause we were a pretty flat organization and, you know, none of us were, you know, better than the other, right. right we had a C-suite, right. but you know, after that it was pretty flat. 
to very structured yeah. with inside of Accenture, right? The hierarchy. Well, I mean, even exists. this morning we were talking about it. You, I think you went to the bathroom, but Colin was like, just to put that in perspective, you know, Exxon has 70,000 people. And <laughs> I was like, and y'all have 10 times the amount of like trying to, like the, just conceptually thinking about how to try and manage an organization like that is insane. It's so many people. It 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 really is in in it it's a shame in some instances, right? Because there's so much untapped talent. Right. right. That, you know, to be on a project. But then again, it also helps because if you establish yourself that way, you're the first one thought of, right? right? So it's you, you, it, it it helps in that way, right? Yeah. So like, you know. I get pinged, you know, we have teams, right? Teams is my thing. So, you know, I get pinged, you know, out of the blue. Somebody's like, hey, I talked to this person who knew this person right. and it said, you worked You're on something guy. similar. Yeah. You know, could you share some information around that? I was like, yeah. So, uh, so, so it's cool. So we did. And so once we kind of got in there, um, you know, I kind of started seeing where it needed to go, where to jump, um, which aggravated the crap out of my COO. But it was funny. Uh, but so one group became um, the cybersecurity, so OT security group, which is a huge practice inside of Accenture now. Lewis has built that pretty large. Um, a lot of, I'd say another, you know, 15% left pretty quick, right? Because they didn't, they knew of that world, they right. wanted to be a part of that world. Um, I actually moved into Accenture Technology a part of ecosystems and ventures, which is our partnership, all of our alliances, right? So our business groups or in, you know, VMware partnership, HP partnership, Dell partnership, moved into that group um, and became kind of the incubation lead, looking at all the new stuff. So I worked with our investment side, looking at startups and then bigger partners and the yeah. startups they, you know, that they were looking at. Um, and then that became edge work, right? Cause edge became the the next new thing and IOT was old and, so I started really understanding that world, a lot more of the IT right. stuff that's out there. Um, and then in the resembling, because that was the another big thing that you see with a lot of the silicon startups, right? They don't have any of the energy background or right. the knowledge or, you know, what problem they're trying to solve. Yeah, they right? can configure a Kubernetes instance like that. But yeah. They have no clue what a wellhead is for sure. Exactly. Nor, and, and they could spin it up, but they can't explain it to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, 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 the guy to a normal field. guy, yeah. right? Of like, yeah. Cooper, what? Um, and, and, and that. So, uh, so anyway, spent some time working with ecosystems a lot with the Hewlett Packard Enterprise um, and their, you know, kind of edge uh, movement and the, you know, stories they had. Lots of great people over there. Then um, in 2019, Jonathan Klein, who was the original founder and CEO of Simation, his non-compete had ran out. So he came to me and he goes, hey, man, you know, what, what do you think about you know, starting a product company? I'm like, I don't have any clue about how that <laughs> works, but in, based on your history, you know, it, it sounds great. You know, I, I'm, I'm down. And this was in August of 2019. And so he, we talked it out. We got, you know, figured out what, you know, how it was going to work and, you know, kind of the, the, the package and stuff and what my role was going to be. And, you know, because we went through several iterations of different things. And then uh, I turned in my notice to Accenture and said, hey, I'm going to go try this thing. They tempted to talk me out of it a little bit, but I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to do this. I said, well, okay, it's fine. So then I uh, moved on to uh, Tech Noir. Um, and so we started out as an AI ops company, um, and he still has the company and they're, they're flourishing and they're more in the ops intelligence world. So, uh, very low code, uh, interface to create machine learning models and solutions, right. And run on small embedded devices. Um, they've got a couple of clients and continuing to grow the put people on, um, wish them the best. I keep track of them, introduce them anytime I can. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, in 2019, it was great. We were having great funding discussions and then 2020 hit COVID, <laughs> then COVID came and, and changed the world. Right. And so it was still pretty good for us because again, it gave us kind of time to, to build right, right. without having a lot of back stuff on there. Um, and then, uh, and work with, you know, the, the first client that we had and onboarded around machine vision and, um, 
then we thought we this goes to another guest you had on. So we thought, oh, we'll just take off the shelf components and just put them together, and we'll have our own box, right? right? We're our own solution. We don't we don't need anybody to make anything for us. So we got you know cameras from Axis, and you know Jets and Nanos were going to be our board, and you know we just put it all together, a little modem in there, and everything will work. The accept it doesn't just work like that, right? <laughs> like, like you can't just take a tell it uh, module modem and stick it on a nano and make it work. Mm -hmm. And the firmware, and we had our own version of Linux, and so it became a lot of screaming matches between me and the dev guy, the software guy, which was in Sweden because it was always pointing fingers, right? He's like, "Ah, oh, your hardware doesn't work," and I'm like, "No, your software doesn't work." Right. You know, back and forth. Oh, well, itot. Uh yeah, ITOT conversion at its best, a hundred percent. And um, and so anyway, learned a bunch of stuff there. Um, and then um, a little over a year ago, uh, CTO for uh, Cloud First, which is a part of Accenture, said, "Hey, would would you ever consider coming back to Accenture?" And I said, "Well, you know, listening." And they were like, "Yeah, you know, when you were here a couple of years ago and you were talking about Edge." We get it now. We get that not everything's going to be cloud based, right? So, um, so anyway, worked that out, um, and it really made sense. You know, I told Jonathan, uh, you know, he really should take my salary and go hire more developers, right? I really wasn't doing what I should be doing, right? My whole role was supposed to be like networking with the community, right? Bringing in new developers for solutions, taking it to market. I mean, we just weren't to that point yet. Um, and you know, he, he felt like, you know, I, I was doing what I needed, but you know, I just, I just didn't feel comfortable. Um, so anyway, came back to Accenture and been, uh, been doing this. I spent the first six months, uh, working in retail. And even though I know absolutely nothing about retail and didn't want to know more about point of sale <laughs> systems. But that's so, for, on the edge side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, I mean, my, I'm kind of right there with you on the uh, some of those auxiliary industries or whatever. I had no exposure to any of that until I started working at Hive Cell on the edge side. And you're like, oh, yeah, actually, this edge thing makes a shitload of sense for retail, especially if you're doing millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions and stuff. And then, you know, a network, the <laughs> the server or the server in your building or the even just the network you know, the network cable gets cut to the building by some random utility person doing something completely unrelated. And then it's like, well, if you're Target or Chick-fil-A, like I know Chick-fil-A has a ton of, they have nukes, nooks, nukes, they have nooks in pretty much every store now. But, uh, you know, having those point of sale systems, like everybody's like, oh yeah, it's just in the cloud. It's like, well, what if you can't access the cloud? Then if you're Chick-fil-A, you have hundreds of pissed off people, tar whoever it yeah. is. Right. And so it's, uh, I, like I said, I had just never, I had no reason to think about it, but I had never thought about it. And then you're like, oh man, that actually makes a ton of sense, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. You would use Chick fil A. Chick fil A is a perfect example of QSRs, right? Quick serve restaurants mm -hmm. that have it figured out. Yeah. But then they also, you know, that recently, you know, so because there was been several articles, right? They had the NUCs and the way they have that all set up. They actually have two for redundancy. Mm -hmm. But they are even looking back at themselves and saying, okay, yeah, we're good. Right. But we still could be better, right? That's it's huge. Chick-fil-A's operational like efforts around how do we make this as efficient and like customer experience focused process as we can is just like it's top notch, you know? And like, cause that's the thing, people don't realize that like these guys are using, you know, you've got your phone, right? So then you submit your order on your phone. Now they can monitor when you leave to go pick it up. So now they know, okay, submit that into the queue wherever it needs to go so that the guys can cook the food because it looks like based off the route, you're going to be five minutes away. Then you've got the, you know, cameras around the building that are pulling data in and in the Chick-fil-A app, you tell it, are you in a car and what color yeah. and all that stuff. So now they can start identifying, Hey, this person is probably in line over here. This based off the computer vision. So make sure that shit is, is in production at, at very least by the time they pull up. And there's all these things that just like, it's very operational efficiency driven that, you know, the average person would have no clue about, right? Like, right. Which is, I think that's how, you know, technology is like really good is the consumer doesn't even realize it, right. right? Like, Hey, it works and it's a good experience. That normally means that the shit on the back end is doing its job. Right? <laughs> that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's, 
it, and it's funny with my wife, right? Because my wife is not tech. And, no, I'm right and, there with you. And doesn't get, you know, she, and it's fine. You know, it's just not her world. Mm-hmm. But anytime something happens, right, where I'm trying to do that, right? I'm making an order or whatever, right? And I'm like, that fucking yeah. blah, 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 <laughs> blah, blah, right? It's, it's broke, man. They need to fix, like, yeah. come on, like, trying to call their customer service and tell them how mm-hmm. to fix their stuff, right? And my wife's just like, how do you know that's how that works? And yeah. I'm like, it's just. I just do. I just pay attention, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, I, I had the same conversation with my wife last night on Netflix, actually, because I was I pulled it up and I was trying to find like my watch list or whatever. You know, normally, like historically, I know they've been messing with how the main home algorithm displays certain things or whatever. But uh, like normally, it's you know a few rows down on the main page that you land on. And I couldn't find. Like I scrolled. I was like, "Where the hell is it?" And she's like, "Just go to the menu and go down to it's the last option of my mm-hmm. list." I was like, well, "That's dumb. It should be the first one or the second one at minimum, right?" And she's like, "Well, I mean, I, I feel like it's pretty accessible." It's like, I know you do, <laughs> but just from like my perspective, <laughs> like I'm so into this stuff and just little things of design are what make or break things so so easily. Um, let's keep talking. I want to. I definitely want to talk OT and security, and I definitely want to get into the edge stuff. Because um, again, I think like edge is edge. I think is probably coming. You know, you've got your hype cycle, then you've got the trough of dis- despair or whatever, and then it comes back up. I think we're probably coming out of the despair. Right, we had that hype cycle coming out of twenty twenty one ish. And there were all these edge companies. And then, of course, now the, with the economy and everything and tech is hurting or whatever. But, uh, you know, the the edge stuff to me is so fascinating because there are so many use cases, but damn near nothing out there in most instances is really even like there's not as many people, the bigger software companies or people like they're still catching up to the edge stuff, right? Like there, I can't tell you how many times we had customers who are like, this is what I want to do. These are the softwares I want to use. And then we go, we start down the line and then we get to whatever software and they're like, we don't have, you know, we don't have a containerized version or we can't run on arm. And it's like, well, you've got a client that's telling you that they want to do this. So can you figure it out? Like, no, well, maybe, you know, like it goes into their queue and it's like, well, shit. <laughs> yeah, but- <laughs> So tell me, tell me a little bit more about how you kind of both just from personal experience and just your thoughts on uh, how you kind of see, see edge playing into the, the energy space or if you guys have done any interesting stuff or looking at any interesting kind of projects in that, that realm, either currently or in, in your past. So I'd say a lot of it is kind of came in two phases, right? Two buckets, I'll put it in. Because again, when we talk about edge, right, there's lots of edges, <laughs> right? Defining the edge is another huge problem, right? So you just even that, when you come into a you know a meeting, is a fun thing because if you don't, then everyone has their own idea of what it is. Yeah. So so my go to Dex is I just start there, right? Mm-hmm. Is from my viewpoint and from Accenture standpoint and kind of how we kind of mark is edge is not a technology it's a topology right right? and 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 it's the same way that you know you talk about it's not energy transition it's energy addition Mm -hmm. right it's the same type of thing so i very quickly depending on who's in the room if it's ot i very quickly go to hey i'm not talking about ripping and replacing right i'm talking about landing and enhancing right Mm -hmm. and that's kind of the thing and so you know again you know traditionally it's been distrib- or, you know, centralized, like from the core, right? Going back to how we were talking about earlier from a SCADA system, right? It's all about, hey, give me a piece of information. Thanks. Give me a piece of information. Right. Thanks. All goes back to one server, or yeah. whether that's well, in the cloud or <laughs> on-prem or yeah. wherever. Where, wherever be, their right. core is at, right? right? It's going to the core. And then it sits there to die. Yep. And then, you know, kind of moving into this distributed fashion, right? As we talked about kind of in the data lake and QC broker where more things are being shared. Um, and, and that kind of comes into the edge, but we really want to call about, you know, an optimize, which is a combination of both, right? It kind of worked out. So, yeah. so I kind of level set there and then I go into, I've got another slide where I talk about the edge is kind of coming up right from a gateway of what a gateway can and can't do 
on up to a micro data right. center, right? And kind of right. how that stands. So then once you get to that level, then, then it becomes, oh, okay, well, I already have the server out there doing this thing or, or a PC doing this thing. And it's like, well, no, now you got right. that. We're just talking about the infra layer right now, right? Then you go into the kind of up that stack, right? Of the software, you know, mm. the Kubernetes, the containers, low code environments, all that stuff. So I'd say still it's all about education, right? Yeah. And getting teams because from there, then I really talk about you need to have a full edge strategy, right? Don't don't go deploy a pilot out in the field with a gateway to do this thing, right? Because again, where are you going to go from here, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't have all the components. So I will say now, finally, clients are starting to get that and understand that. And so is the rest of the market, right? So as you've mentioned, right, through COVID, a lot of the smaller companies kind of faltered off to the wayside. But those that are left now, the bigger companies are going, hey, we can't, we can't build this fast enough right. internally. Let's go partner, right? Let's go white label. Let's go put these people under the hood, right? And that's where you see the Zedatas of the world coming from, right? I mean, they've got a solid solution. They've got a solid kind of ecosystem that they work with, with other smaller per 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 perspectives. And then you got the runway to, you know, to start doing some bigger stuff now that they've partnered up. Um, and then you kind of see that, I'd say the other side of the equation, I'd say, is the, from the cloud providers themselves, right? That being, right. you know, Azure Stack, it's pretty solid. Azure Stack Edge, right? And they've got some new stuff coming out in November that makes them pretty sticky, right? And and that's an easier conversation too to a lot of the IT side of the clients, right? right? Of, hey, it's just the same look and feel. Um, you know, AWS, they have their stuff. You know, they've got a lot of cool stuff as well. Um, you know, Google just come out with a newer version of Distributed Edge, you know, that kind of addresses some stuff. They've done some alliances, um, you know, in the manufacturing space around with litmus automation and yeah. stuff. Google will never have a place in energy. They've already shot themselves in the foot yep. with that. I think it's sad, but it is what it is, right? Uh, you know, this, uh, even even clients today will say mm -hmm. that, hey, we were doing stuff with Google. We liked it, but no. Yeah. I mean, they destroyed yeah. any, any confidence that anybody in that space could have had right. in their uh and their ability to uh, build something out and then not, yeah, it's just, I mean, as you and I both know, the energy industry is very much so driven by risk. And if you're obvious about the risk, it's going to be a lot harder for yeah. someone to be like, yeah, go ahead and put all of our stuff on GCP and hope that Google doesn't get mad about it and shut it all off. Yeah. And then we're effed, you yeah. know, like that's, uh, I agree. I use, I mean, I use GCP for, for some of our database stuff internally even just because we're we're a google shop and it integrates really nicely with a lot of stuff we can automatically back up you know our google analytics and our ad accounts and all our google services directly to bigquery yeah. natively which is sweet right yeah. but if i was you know if i was building something that ran on it which we are yeah uh, it's not on google <laughs> I guess so it's a it's a weird it's a it's, weird dynamic it for is sure it is a weird dynamic so so anyway, so I, I'd say a lot of that's still in education yeah. mode, right? We've seen a lot of pilots, a lot of, you know, POC type stuff, a lot of stuff that it's been called edge. It's truly not. Where, um, where do you see people kind of either tripping up or making kind of either bad strategic decisions or bad uh, moves kind of in that edge space, whether it be, you know, security or like, one of the big things that I never thought about, even when I was there, um, until it started kind of popping up, but it was like you know, the CICD part of of Edge, right? So the whole concept for if you don't know, I've got a great uh, personally. Uh, I personally think it's a great pitch uh, from one of the energy tech nights you can go find on on the DW channel. But uh, talking about Edge, but the whole concept is. Everything doesn't need to go to the cloud. The cloud has become, uh, I use the dumpster fire uh, GIF in my presentation for that because that's basically what everyone has done. Hey, just put it in the cloud and then we'll figure it out. It's like, well, you put a bunch of shitty unstructured, you know, data in the cloud. That just means you have shitty unstructured data. Like it doesn't make it any better. Yes, you have it stored somewhere, but that doesn't ma make it actionable or easier to use. The whole concept of edge is being able to move the compute closer to the source of the data, do more of the processing, at the site of the data 
a lot of people have struggled like trouble kind of comprehending what that is but uh one of our potential customers at at Hivestyle gave us this use case and it was Walmart and you know Walmart has dozens of security cameras at every single Walmart and they've got thousands of Walmarts right and so it's like they have to record all this video because of liability security etc but it's like but what if they don't like when do you cut off storing that video like why do you need to store all of the video like you've got I can't imagine how many hours a day a Walmart is damn near empty that it's like, why are we even storing this? Right. And so the whole concept would be, Hey, we can put these edge servers in the, in each store. They can all run the same software. They can be managed from one location from our IT department somewhere else, but they can sit there and process and do computer vision and say, Hey, if there's video without humans in it or people in it, don't save it because we don't need it. Right. (laughs) Right. Like just the storage costs of that stuff become incredible because it all compounds right like that's i think that's the big thing with edge is you know you're talking about hundreds or thousands of locations whenever you're talking about what a good edge use case kind of think looks like really in most situations there's still others where even a handful of locations edge can be very useful but um you know just being able to store data locally process it and say hey i only need out of the thousand hours that a video that we recorded this week i only need five of it because only five of it has people in it or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, where do you kind of, where do you see people kind of unsure about things or, you know, maybe even making bad decisions today because that sets them up for, like, if this is coming, which I think you and I both are in the camp that it is, then that's going to screw them essentially in the future, right? Whether it be, again, security or even just like the frameworks, right? Like that was a big struggle for us running virtual machines versus containers versus Kubernetes. No one is experienced with Kubernetes on right. most energy side uh, of things yet. So that's still a whole new conversation, but what are, yes, it, it's, no, that's a huge question. <laughs> so. It's it, it, it very much is right. So what I have seen is very single point specific solutions being rolled out Mm -hmm. because it was to solve an immediate need right or or a a thought of need right of of, of issue um and a lot of those times are happening because of individual business units or have a problem somebody locally comes to them with a solution hey we can put it in and all this fix their need and then they come into their mid-year reviews or whatever with their other colleagues and they're like, hey, we fixed it this way. And somebody in South Dakota says, oh, yeah, that's cool and all, but it doesn't work for this, right? So, again, right. it's not scalable in any instance. Um, and then to your point, too, as well, this frameworks, right? So nobody had that conversation up front <laughs> of what all is it involved when you say an edge, right? An edge solution, right? From an operating system across, right? right? Um and, the, and then the last thing I would say is nobody ever talks about how do you stack use cases right. with the same infrastructure, right? Right. It's always about, hey, here's 10 use cases, but each one of them require a different component, right? right. And so it's like, okay, well, I'll start with this one. Oh, that one worked great. Now let's stack this one. Oh, well, not so much we should, you know, so that stacking instance is, is new and definitely then you get people's eyes that light up when you say that right of saying hey if you just had cameras out there you could see one they're wearing their ppe right Right. do they have the things that they need two did they fall down are they on a ladder you know all the stuff pose estimation type of stuff uh hazard location areas blockings all those type of things right so that again has kind of been a missed opportunity i think in, in 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 moving edge forward um and then when you talk about the security aspect of it as well, is something that I, I'm getting more and more into conversations about, right? So, you know, a lot of OT security is going on. It kind of fits in that framework. But some of when you're talking about CICD stuff, right, mm-hmm. doesn't really play nice with the security framework. Right. Um, you know, and, 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 and large companies have been trying to figure it out for a long time. What does, you know, a, 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 a trusted yes. IOT gateway. Well, how does that fit into the architecture? How does, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, no, right. That's where all this gets, I mean, that's what people I think don't 
appreciate when I say edge, right? Is it's it's not just software, it's the underlying framework, the architectures, the hardware that it's running on, and then on top of that, the networking and security aspects of all of that. And then you've got, oh yeah, we need a camera that pulls 4K over here, and we need this sensor from that company, and this one's Modbus, and this one's TCP IP, and like <laughs> it just becomes a, a rat's nest very, very quickly. And I think that's uh, you know, because that's it's one of the weird things with the edge propo- proposition, at least, right? Is it's like, hey, you know, it theoretically, or it, the whole one of the big pitches in my mind benefits for the oil field, which led me to kind of take that job with hive cell was, Hey, this can run in a disconnected environment, which is great. But then you've got, and you've got a lot of use cases for edge, which are disconnected plants, except power plants, all things like that. Right. Where it's like, Hey, nothing externally needs to be able to connect to this on purpose because it's just, (laughs) that's the most secure thing we can do is completely detach it, um, from the network. But then it's like, well, shit, well, how do you push updates to it? <laughs> right. So it's like it's this big dichotomy of like push and pull. And, you know, the the IT networking guys are like, yeah, you're not going to have access to this thing behind our firewall. I've got to open that port up for you if if you want. And you need to ask me to do that because that's their role. Right. And yep. it's like, well, no, I just need to push this little software update. It's like, how do we do that? You know? Yeah, that that's a big a big area of discussion right now yeah. is 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 what is the best practice for that, right? So where, let's use your video analytics use case, right? You're, you're 100% correct, right? None of those images should go to the cloud unless the algorithm isn't doesn't believe what it's telling you it is, correct. is is, right? So whatever that threshold may be for the accuracy of that model, then yes, you send that, right? Because it needs to be labeled and mm-hmm. re-ran and retrained. Um, so it's okay, you know, it's easy to set up rules based on that and say, okay, here, store locally, seven days, with everything, right. but these bucket over here at midnight every night, send it off, it. right? And then you can set it up on the cloud side that says, hey, every Friday, somebody's going to go in and annotate it, rerun the model and, and push it back down, right? Mm-hmm. And, and how does that, that happen? But but that's the key, right? Is, is, is one, how do you transverse the layers in the network to get that out? Mm-hmm. And then get back in, but then also trust it enough that that okay, it can't just throw a control right right out of that. Um, and and and, and I'm having real world conversations around this because yeah. even then, just basic Loran sensors to a Loran server. Well, do you, can you name a tool right now that can actually look at that network? <laughs> right, <laughs> I couldn't. I, I'm like oh, I. I it says it's encrypted. What, what does it matter, right? right? right. Like, wait, what do we care? Um, but that's the thing, right? And when you start talking about security visibility on top of, you know, the the the, the plans that you want to do with stuff, right. right? The updates and all of that that comes with it. So I'm definitely seeing that somebody needs to come up with an answer for that. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I think they'll start seeing some movement. I've posed that question to a lot of, you know, companies that I work with and in, in, in especially in the startup space of like, hey, can your tool do this? Right. If it could, you know, I mean, and, and I think that's how we'll see the change, right? I mean, that's, you know, and they should be looking out for that as well, right? I mean, the clear blade story, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, how smart was that to you, you to figure out, hey, you know what? What if I built something that was an easy migration plan for IoT? Right. Oh, hey, you know, their business quadrupled overnight. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where we will start seeing some, some things come in. Um, I'd say oddly enough too, I'm starting to see a lot more power, um, in service now that they've got some real extendable capability in the OT space, right? So Accenture worked with service now to create an OT module. So you have your stuff like, uh, Dragos and Nozomi that does all that asset discovery. Then we'll push that into service now, and then you can set up the, you know, the, what you want to do rules-based from there and kind of push that down. Yeah, I'm like, well, why can't you now extend that to Kube clusters, right? right. And, and, and the software right. revisioning and all of these. So we'll see. You know, I mean, it's it's an ever-changing world. Yeah, and, you well, that's know, the cool part about it being so early, right? Is yeah. there's just, I mean, it's the same way I felt when I first kind of got through some of the initial hive cell pitches when I was interviewing with them. I was like, damn, there is a lot of opportunity here. And I didn't even know all the 
problems and shit we were going <laughs> to run into and face at that point. But I was like, man, this is, this is slick. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much, right? Like, uh, CICD for example. Right. So like, you know, uh, what happens to your edge device when you're pushing an update and you lose network, you have to account for that scenario because that ha- it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. It's just not yeah. if it's yeah. just a win. Right. Yeah. And so it's like you have to have not only software on the backside to say, hey, this didn't work. Wait until there is connectivity. Validate that that connectivity is strong enough to be able to push this and then start pushing it again. But then also on the edge device that says, hey, we didn't get the full download. Kind of like on your iPhone. You're right. Mm-hmm. It says, hey, do you want to download it now or later? OK, we'll do it while I'm asleep so I don't have to worry about it, whatever. But then it's like if it doesn't finish and your code isn't written correctly and it started to update. Well, shit, you're, you're, you've just blocked, <laughs> you've completely it, locked up your server. and It is a nightmare that I still live today, yeah. right? So as we were rolling out our devices, right, we had, you know, a fleet management screen, mm-hmm. right, where you could see last poll came in everything. And we, someone pushed an update to the model. And you could sit there and watch them just go red, <laughs> just like, a, like 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 just, a flight board. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> like to, like cancel, 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 yeah. cancel, 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 cancel. And we had scripted in there basically like if it didn't if it didn't have hash back to the MQTT broker, right? It would power down the modem and basically reset the modem. And you know, eight out of ten times that that corrects things, right? right? A little power cycle. Mm-hmm. So I'd say. 10% of them came back that way and the rest did. All of these units were not in Texas. Yeah. So that's the big <laughs> thing that, you know, yeah. people don't even think about is it's like, okay, the benefit of edge is I don't have to have techs or, you know, a server manager it guy at every single location because it's distributed and I can manage it centrally. But then if I fuck it up and I brick my, my server, I have to have someone go out there. So you have to build that pipeline. So it's robust enough. And that, but that's again, that's where all these opportunities are, in yeah. my opinion, right? Like, yeah. it's a, uh, it's it's kind of a wild west world, but I think there's a lot of, you know, it's not new, the the axe, right? Like we've yeah. done all of this in the cloud, we've done it with on prem before. It's just now we're taking pieces and learnings from those and figuring out, okay, well, here's all these nuances that we don't have to account for in my, you know, AWS cluster because it's got its own dedicated lines and backup power generators and all this other shit, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, we've PNID loops have been around forever, right? Yeah. We've done it in some form or fashion. I've we've remote shut wells, we've changed choke braces, all this. But you're correct, right? It's now moving away. From, it's it's just again giving it much more capability, mm-hmm. in 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 really dialing stuff in. Is when uh, do you when do you think? Uh, how far away are we from seeing? Because I know going back to your the kind of SCADA automation side, I know we're starting to see. Uh, call it pseudo automation some things basic things can be automated again we've talked about risk before so the risk thing is always one of the biggest hurdles you're going to run into with automating field equipment and the oil field but where do you see kind of how far out are we from having some of these things these lower hanging fruit things not a fully automated drilling rig but you know some of the opening and closing valves chokes you know distributing i mean because there are companies that are doing that right like Mm -hmm. hey here's the your automated chemical distribution for your um, production, all of your wells, and then you can look at them and change this one. And hey, it's going to release at 0.1 gallons per minute for five minutes until it hits this volume, and then it's going to shut off. Right? Where do you see that kind of? How do you see that evolution today and and kind of moving forward? So yeah, you're right. There there are there are te- there are fields. That have that today, right? Yeah. That you can change choke, flow rates, all that type of stuff. But you still have a guy that's going out there, right? Yep. I mean, at the end of the day, still got to have a measurement guy calibrate and change orifice plates and stuff like that, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that would be very slick. You know, man, maybe that's the next business idea, right? Is create mm-hmm. an, an AI orifice plate, like right? Where it's like, where it's like yeah, yeah. Just, like, just can, you know, die from whatever. Um, so anyway, he, you will start seeing more and more of it, right? So I'd say actively, not personally, but a t- I know a team that's engaged with an operator to figure it out for the Permian, right? Of what that looks like and how to get there, um, you know, for a lot of their assets. So I'd say that's, you know, probably a year in the 
think tank banking, right? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, probably go from there. Um, I will say a very large uh, UAE company is on the path. They've already done one of their fields is fully autonomous. Uh, That's awesome. And uh, they're going to continue to move. So, so it's coming, right? So I think, yeah. yeah, it definitely will happen. I think the next area that, that is kind of an interesting and in, 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 we'll see it play out more in the utilities before we see it in oil and gas, mm-hmm. right? Because usually they're the first to adopt. But truly virtualized PLCs. Yeah. Right? They're coming. Um, they're coming. I know my diehard <laughs> I&E guys out there are, are going to be like, nope, never. You know, it has to be this way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's coming. And, you know, it's coming. It, it'll get there. Um, I, I'm interested to see how many sensor companies really start going 5G enabled yeah. and getting the price down. I think that's one that, that'll be to watch. Mm-hmm. Um and or um, truly just coming with MQTT out of the bat, right? Yeah. Without being proprietary. So that's a perfect segue because I wanted, I think this is one of the first times we've talked about MQTT on the show. So I wanted to unpack that a little bit, tell people about what MQTT is and then kind of go into why MQTT came around, what the benefits of it are for, especially around the kind of SCADA IoT side of things. Yeah, so MQTT, right, is just a message bus, right? It's telemetry. It's not new, right? It was back in the late 60s, 70s. I didn't realize it was that old. It was. It came from IBM. Uh, Arlen Nipper is one of the the forefathers, right, from Cirrus Logic mm-hmm. that actually works hand-in-hand with inductive automation. And I rest. guess that makes sense, though, right? A good 40-year adoption cycle for yeah. oil filter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think if if I'm not mistaken, the first IoT MQTT message – was a toaster, I want to say. It <laughs> might have awesome. been a refrigerator. I might have that wrong. But, but anyway. Home appliance. Yeah, the home appliance, yeah. right? That went through there. So, um, but yeah, the whole point of it is, is again, going back to where we were talking around, right? Today, everything's pull and response, right? And, and it's, it's you got to configure it. And you, it's, again, all data is coming whether you need it or not. Yeah. Right? Th- for those of you who have never had to deal with that, um, Bobby and I both dealt with that at our the company we both worked with or both worked together at RDS. But the problem with that is if comms go down or uh, even if there's just some lag, right? The server that's receiving the data will have nulls or blank spaces or even the the time series coming in out of order. Uh, all of these things end up screwing up your database very easily and very quickly, um, especially if you're not watching it, that can mm-hmm. happen. And then, it just keeps going, right? And yeah. it, it never, it's not intelligent, essentially, right? It's just kind of a dumb, hey, here's the data, it's available, push it over here, and then it's just going to go over there, yeah. right? And, it, and, it, and it's, a, it's impossible to troubleshoot some things when you have a bad actor <laughs> like that, right? Because Well, and the data doesn't sawtooth. stop coming in either. That's the other yeah. part. It's like, okay, well, I've identified where it is, but now I've got to go figure out how to rewrite it to correct it while I'm still getting new lines of data every however often right yeah yeah exactly um and the other the other piece of that is 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 the way that the data moves right so it's from the sensor pointer plc rt mm-hmm. whatever up to the SCADA system over to the historian yep. and it goes there to die yeah. right <laughs> and so if you're a reservoir engineer or your facilities engineer or just whoever right lost you know whatever you're trying to do and you have an application that wants to utilize that data I have seen personally at a large producer, it take almost two years to get the right approvals and the right person to unlock the data out of the historian (laughs) just to transverse into the other side. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so yeah, so it's miserable. So, you know, about, I don't know, four years ago, maybe it really started popping on the scene. Um, Inductive automation was kind of the one really the first ones to push. It was, this idea of having a broker, right? Of how you you have everything published data to it, you 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 have it in a JSON format, you have it rules based, right? It doesn't have to be time based, and then anybody that wants to have that data can subscribe to it, right? So your other, if you want to test out some new machine learning algorithm, company X Y Z, great, 
Open right. them up a pipeline, let them do what they need to do. You don't like it anymore, shut it off, right? Yeah. It's 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 really tight and easy integrations. Um and 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 having it in a in a kind of stair step manner as well even makes it even more better, right? To where you have it from your core, whether it be cloud or, or on prem, you have your master spark plug B right. broker, then you can have smaller brokers doing what the things it needs to do. And again, serving Right. Multiple applications um, on that. And it does bring a much more secure environment as well because yeah. you have it set up in the, in the right way. Yeah. Now that's, uh, I'm excited to see how, how that kind of grows and helps just make the oil field data just one more robust, but two, much more accessible because that's what we've talked about plenty of times, right? Like yeah. IT departments in most operators, I think we're even having a, a topic on this uh, at Fuse in a couple of weeks go buy your fuse tickets if you haven't um but it's like it should be almost embedded in the teams not this overarching power center of hey i'm an engineer and i need this data but i can't get it because it has restricted it or whatever and it's like that is just killing all of the internal innovation that you could possibly have because the other part of that is they're still engineers so they're going to find a way to get the fucking data <laughs> like i'll work around it i'll yeah. dump it to a csv like whatever we're going to use the data how we're going to use it, uh, just make it easier for us. And we won't have to call you all the time. The number one perpetrated lie between it and OT is OT thinks it doesn't really work 24 <laughs> seven and it thinks that OT just has no clue about anything. Right. Right. And, 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 that, and that's not the case, right? I mean, not at all. <clears throat> if they would just work together easily and understand it's for the betterment of the day to day, a lot of cool stuff could get done. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, yeah. So we've got a few more minutes. I did want to, uh, I wanted to ask just quickly, what do you, what kind of cool stuff do you see coming on the kind of SCADA IOT side of things? Like you mentioned LoRaWAN, which is not new by any right. means, but I, adoption of it, I would say is newer, at least in the oil field. Um, for people who don't know what LoRaWAN is, we give them a, a quick blurb on it. Yeah, it's just it's just lower lower in the frequency, right? It's just you know meant for short distances, small burst packets, right? Um, it's just a different you know think about it from like Bluetooth, very mm -hmm. similar, right? It's just a different different bands in the frequency. So good for like on pad location or on pad data distribution, or can it, we? It can go a little bit further. I'd say anything under seven miles. This is where we want to keep good. it. So you yeah. could, you know, you could do, you know, a, a tie-in, right? And pressures in the tie-in on the pipeline mm -hmm. back to a CPF kind of in there. Um, a lot of times the, the kind of the preferred methodology is, is wherever your network tower is, right? right? So not like your, your ATT Verizon towers, but your, your actually network, field telecom yeah. network tower. You set your, your server your gateway uh, in there and then kind of let multiple plats have it right. versus having a gateway in every RTU yeah. box yeah. that's at every pad. No, I think that that was one of the the things I realized when I was at High Cell talking to all this a lot of SCADA guys like yourself on the on the edge stuff is it's like, you know, the company thought, oh well we'll have, you know, a hive cell on every pad or on every well. And it's like, no, that's not how this right. this will be at those kind of like uh near edge locations which i equate the cell phone tower is the perfect like analogy for normal people right your phone is the edge device your cell phone right. tower is this me middle ground which a lot of people don't realize have they basically all have data centers at each cell phone tower now in some capacity and then that gets pushed up to the cloud right, right? that's gonna be the same situation you'll have all these iot devices on each location on all the pads those get pushed to this kind of regional level yep. field level hubs and then that does all the compute processing computer vision ml models etc and then pushes what else is needed up to the cloud um i think it's uh i think that model makes a whole lot of sense for because the, they were uh, that's the other big thing they already have infrastructure there right mm -hmm. like most people in my experience with edge want to put it it's just this you can't break them of how they normally how things have always been done right and so it's like okay well we'll just put it in this SCADA cabinet with the other servers, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, or in the, you know, the server room with all the other servers on them, right? Right. Um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to open up a lot of really interesting stuff, make things so much safer, um, and also make 
the field guy's lives just that much you're more empowered because it's like hey i know what's going on i know the tools i need i know where it is and i'm going somewhere with a purpose instead of just driving my same route <laughs> every yeah. two weeks or whatever and you know you're 100 percent. it's all about the the level of being comfortable yeah. right i mean and i and i think that it will start to get much faster as you know the field guys are younger right they, they're used to ha- they've they're they're cloud native they're right. used to having their things um so you know like again like if if you were an operator and i said hey let's quit wiring up all these sensors let's go to wireless right, right. you're gonna be like okay cool do it right versus when i was telling them hey we were gonna go wireless they're like are you stupid yeah like no yeah. right um in in and, they, and it did take one bad look, you know, on that. I mean, I'll never forget sitting at, at this manufacturer and telling them they were lying about their battery lives. But, you know, that was the only thing that was bad, right? If something would happen and it would continue to, hey, I'm 15 pounds, hey, I'm 15 pounds, right. hey, I'm 15 pounds, you know, you're going to drain that battery. And so when you have to go replace batteries, then yep. kind of bad look. But, but I think all of that is changing. So I think that's definitely kind of where – it's moving to is no longer will it be thought of, okay, yes, I have seven wells on this pad, so I need to have seven right. different meters and all of this stuff, right? I think all of that will start getting condensed, which I mean, for some part you do. For measurement, you have to, right? Because right. of the lease yep. agreements and all that. So that's- Got to pay those downside. royalties and those yeah. taxes. Got to pay the royalties. So I think that's what it'll start coming up and you'll start looking at how you know how my whole field interacts and is there information that i can share to another field um and i'd say then other companies you know starting to share that data as well right so you can really get into you know what we were talking about with the the mud logging right where you can see hey i did this type of work over on this type of well and got this type of result now i can replicate it Oh, I'm seeing these early signs from the the pressure trends that I'm seeing, so I need to do this. Right. I think that's really where the the few the the next generation is coming. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, like just the little stuff, right? And I think that's one of the few areas that we have actually seen edge deployed in the oil field specifically is like preventative maintenance type stuff, right? Hey, I think early on a lot of that was super hyped as AI when it was just conditional <laughs> <laughs> statistical analysis. I, it's obviously getting better, but um yeah i think the the pie in the sky thing with with edge is you know the uh distributed machine learning models right mm-hmm. and so uh federated learning you know if and I, I don't i don't think there was a really good way to describe that to the average person until uh, chat gbt to me is like the perfect example of that people don't think about they're using it on their computer is like the edge instance but every person that uses it is a unique instance right and so you're having but just look at what's happened in a year on that model with you know you it's the fastest growing app you get millions of people using it now pretty much on a daily weekly basis and so look at how much better it can get in such a short amount of time when you do have that ability to feed one giant model from all these sub models and all their unique instances and nuances and then just create this giant loop. New models, new learnings, feedback gets up to the mother model, it gets retrained and then pushes that back down. And that, I mean, I have no idea how far away we are from that in the oil field, but that gets me super excited about like the potential because there's just so much data and there's so little time. and <laughs> There's so few people st- still in the industry that it's like, that's gonna be a really, really cool thing whenever it does happen. Yeah, secondary production. Mm-hmm. is the number one use case for edge right yeah. and 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 that version of ai right because you're 100 percent correct is there are plunger and pumping lift companies that are out there that do have solutions and they, they fit a need um, but yeah that's not true ai mm-hmm. right and and once it gets to that point where you can have that you know millisecond reflex loop yep can you imagine how much production we would get out of older wells it yeah. would be huge yeah no, it's gonna be it's gonna be crazy oh, shit man we're almost we're we're up to an hour now yeah. um so at the end we normally do a uh little speed round um what were we watching i was watching uh <laughs> i was watching watch what happens live with my wife uh last night it's on we watch a lot of bravo shows at my house um <laughs> 
I'm going to, I'm going to kind of piggyback off of something he does. So instead of asking these open-ended questions, I'm going to ask you just some multiple choice questions. So just give me your, uh, Mac PC or Linux. It's so difficult, right? So it depends on what I'm doing. I'm on my tablet when I'm cruising and just doing that, that Apple. If I'm on doing work stuff, it's got to be a PC. Yep. Has to be a PC. Anything that I'm going to do for home automation or anything like that, it's Linux. Yeah. So all three. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, uh, I kind of feel like that's probably going to be a pretty common answer here. Uh, cause I, I think a lot of my coding frustrations come from the fact that I'm on a fucking PC and not a Mac or Linux, uh, out of the gate, uh, Xbox, Nintendo or PlayStation. So I have the PS five. That thing is a bulking beast, but I like it better than Xbox. Firefox, Chrome, Edge, or Brave? Brave. All day, every day. Although, I'm upset with Brave because now they've had an update. <clears throat> so the crypto mm -hmm. wallet extensions broke. <sighs> and now you have to go one of two. They've like reduced the, the options, which I'm like, you know what? I don't care anyway, Riley. It was you know, talking right. point zero 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 P, yeah. right? But when the Brave browser comes up, now you have this like, 404 error box right <laughs> this is glaring you in the face um, fix it brave we, <laughs> we like I, I need you to fix it yeah we like your shit yeah just fix it uh okay here's here's a fun one nba jam call of duty doom warcraft or oregon trail none <laughs> <laughs> not a gamer done no no i'm not a gamer just that uh no, PGA. Okay. Golf. Yeah. All day. The Tiger Woods one, the yes. OG, where yes. you could spin the shit out of all. Yes. God, I played so many hours of that game. Yes, yes. I, <laughs> I, um, I, yeah, I tried playing Fortnite with the kids, but oh, that's Fortnite's just so hard. It's just too much. It's just too like, much. I'm like, wait, no, what? There's, that's a whole nother like level of skill. I feel like that generation has that was really into Fortnite because sh the shooter alone in Fortnite is hard enough, but yeah. then you've got these kids that are just building <laughs> while they're shooting. And I'm like, I can't even, my brain can't work that fast. No, it's the same way with Roblox. Yeah. Oh dude. Roblox. What a great, like uh, my six year old uses it. You know, we've got the restrictions and stuff set up, but still it's like, I People don't, people sleep on, they're like, oh yeah, it's a video game. It's like, no, it's yep. literally every single video game that you could ever want yep. in one spot, yep. right? Like it's such a great platform. Yeah. GCP, AWS, or Azure? Azure first, GCP second, AWS third. I like that. GPT, Claude, Bard, or something else? Jury's still out. Jury's still I'm, out. I'm right there with you. Uh, Postgres, SQL, or Snowflake? Snowflake. That's another good answer. So Bobby and I, I'm gonna. I haven't even told Bobby that I'm switching the uh, the style of questions, but we're gonna we're gonna keep doing that because this is. I think this is a lot more fun too. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is. So I, I kind of you know as I was mentioning you know I, I keep up with your podcast and I watched a couple more just to mm -hmm. go okay what do I expect right? It's something that's instilled from an Accenture right. You have to prep six weeks before oh, you for sure. before you do the thing right whatever and so i had to was thinking i was like all right i, I need to know a book and I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the book one will be tricky well and that's it's even a tricky question to ask right because yeah. some people are like for the longest time i didn't read books i just listened to podcasts or audiobooks and all that stuff but it's uh man it's been fun i can't believe the hour's already gone yeah no for sure but on, on books so the last thing next five moves patrick david bet you follow him Hey, great story. Great story. Nice. I'm, I'll, I'll add that to my, uh, my list. Yeah. But no, I do. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah. How do people, how can people find you? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I, uh, I, I have a Twitter, 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 or X. I was going to say, it's not even Twitter X, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> An X troll profile, but I don't, I don't, I don't really, yeah, that's a bad one. Uh, and then Instagrams, you see a bunch of kids stuff. So, oh, for sure. Yeah. So LinkedIn. Quentin Jones on Twitter. 
Quentin with a Q. No, Quentin Jones on LinkedIn. So on you'll never LinkedIn. find a Quentin Sorry. Jones on X. <laughs> <laughs> if you do, it's not me. <laughs> we have butchered uh, that part. <laughs> it made it more confusing. Quentin Jones on on LinkedIn. Yes. Not on the non-existent Twitter platform. Um, appreciate it, man. Uh, Thanks for coming. Yeah, Thanks, everybody.